in Revelation chapter 2, and I'm just going to teach verses 1 through 7 as we focus on one of the seven churches of Revelation. I call this message, Don't Leave Your First Love. Can you turn to the person sitting next to you and say, don't leave your first love? <laughs> don't leave your first love. Don't leave your first love. You're going to hear this a bunch today, so I'm just getting you ready, okay? Don't leave your first love. So let me ask you a question. Do you remember the first time that you fell in love? Think back. For some of us, my, she said yes. So some of us, <laughs> some of us, it's been a while. <laughs> Others, maybe it's more recent. Maybe it was high school or college or when you met your spouse. Or uh, maybe you're still waiting for that. If that has happened to you, it's an exciting thing, isn't it? It's kind of overwhelming and can be a little consuming of your life. But after some time passes, it can decrease a little bit, that feeling, that excitement. And because, you know, you kind of get used to them and, oh, you still love them, but it's not like it was at first. So now shift your thinking, if you would, to when you first met Jesus. And I'm speaking to my Christian brothers and sisters now. When you first met Jesus, how over the moon, you were grateful to him, that he loved you. And you, so you loved him for giving you a second chance, that he set you free from your sin, that he gave you the promise of heaven, eternal life. But then maybe as some time passes, as years go by, maybe you aren't as passionate as you were at first. So what do we do about that? I hate to do this, but there was this song when I was in junior high school, a secular song, and I kept going through my mind, so I think I'm supposed to say it. There was a song, uh, it was in junior high, and it was a secular song, and it was Love Will Keep Us Together. Remember that? Captain and Tennille. It was on the radio constantly. I think they still play it all the time. Love Will Keep Us Together. And the song is about this gal who is singing to her guy, and she's basically saying, look, just remember me. As the years go on, as you, when you get tempted, remember how much I love you and bond, that foundation that we have will keep us together. You know, that's what the song's all about. And, and I went back and was looking at the lyrics of that, and it seems like they stole the idea from this section of scripture or from the Bible, because our love for God is a response to how much he loves us. And that's what's supposed to bind us together. We come into his family by faith, and then he puts his spirit in us, and then we have this bond of love that lasts forever. Certainly takes us through this life until we meet him. And we're supposed to live that way, in that love. And so this book, this section here, these seven verses are very timely because the world— and some Christians are very critical of the church today. And often it has to do with a perceived lack of love, doesn't it? I think that's a big problem right now. So this addresses that issue. And it's a reminder to us that the Christian life is not supposed to be just a transactional thing with God, but it's supposed to be something that we're motivated by love for God as we respond to him. So that's what we're going to look at today. We'll begin here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. And here's what we're told. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I'm going to stop there for a few moments and kind of remind us how we got here. Revelation is a letter with a series of visions sent to seven churches in Asia. Uh, today, it would be Turkey, that area, if you picture that. And it's a letter from Jesus to these churches. I'm going to slow down in these messages to these seven churches, do one per week, because what ends up happening is folks get so charged up about the end time stuff that they usually skip all of this and just go to the other things, you know? Have you ever done that? Just reading it like, but you know, these two chapters 
I'm of the belief that we won't be around here for chapters 6 through 19. I'm a pre-trib rapture guy. And so I believe the church is removed. Now, you may have a different view of that. And so I believe, like many do, that these two chapters are actually some of the best, most applicable things for us in this book. And so, not that the rest isn't, it's important for us, but I want to spend some time on this and talk about what the main issues were that were going on and how we can apply that to us. Last time, we learned in chapter 1, verse 19, that this book is really divided into three parts. Revelation is divided into three parts. If you go back to verse 19, chapter 1 was the things that you have seen, the, the things in the past that Jesus was telling John about. And then the present... The things which are would be chapters 2 and 3, and that's what we're going to focus now in the next few weeks. And then the future things in chapters 4 through 22, as he said there in verse 19, the things which will take place after this. Okay? So we learned that last time. Another thing that we learned last time that that comes out here in verse 1 is that Jesus is the one who's in the center of the churches. Those lampstands, they represent the seven churches— And Jesus is the one in the midst. He's also the one, we were told in chapter 1, that's holding the leaders, the angels, in the palm of his hand, in his right hand. He's holding the leaders there. And so I would just like to stop here for a moment and express to you how important the church is to him. He loves the church. Some people today say, I don't like the church. I don't like the people that are in the church. I don't like going to church. And that's really too bad because Jesus does. And so we're supposed to love what he loves and be all about what he is. And he loves the church. We're told there in verse 1 that this was sent to an angel. And I talked about this at length last time, so I won't go into a lot now. But there's some disagreement on what that really means. So on the one hand, it could be a, a literal angel that's like the guardian angel of each one of these seven churches, and that could be the case. I don't know. Or many people believe it's just a representative of that church, like a pastor or an elder or or someone like that. But either way, here's what I think is even more important to us, is the letter is really sent to the people in the church, right? And so we're supposed to pay attention because though it's written to a church, in this case, Ephesus, These messages are to all churches. Because go back to verse 1, if you would, in chapter 1. The very first verse tells us that this is written to God's servants. So us. It's written to all of us. So it is very applicable for us. Some have a view that these letters to the letter to these seven churches... These seven churches represent eras down through the ages. Like this first one represents the first hundred years and then so on. And and I'll mention those as we go because that could be some symbolic thing that the Lord wants us to take from this. But you got to be careful with that. Otherwise, you start to move away from just accepting the criticism of the problem that that church was doing and that all the churches today that are doing the same things. You don't want to move away from that because then it becomes only symbolic. And and I don't think it's supposed to be that way. I like to remember these were actual churches that existed in that day, and they have similarities with churches today. These apply to then and now. Henry Morris said their problems are our problems, and they are. Because it's just people, right? So this one was in Ephesus. Ephesus worshipped Diana. Diana, they had built this giant temple to her there at the time. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. There's a picture of the ruins there from Ephesus that stands today. Diana was the Greek goddess of fertility. It was very sexual in nature of what was going on there. It was basically a sex cult religion where they would legalize all sorts of immoral activity and sacrifice to this goddess Diana. And it was, this place was a stronghold of Satan. 
It was a, a bigger city at the time, about the size of Boise, about 250,000 people that were there. Paul the Apostle spent more time in Ephesus than in any other place. He was there for three years. He planted a church there. And he actually had Timothy, who he wrote two letters to in the New Testament, become the overseer of that church. If you remember from the book of Acts, a couple named Priscilla and Aquila, they had a house church in Ephesus. Also, John, the writer of Revelation, we think that he was eventually the overseer of the church or churches in Ephesus. Uh, Acts 19 tells us that tons of people got saved there, that there were all kinds of healings going on and miracles, so much so that all the people that were doing witchcraft and things like that, they stopped doing it, and it caused a riot to break out there in Acts chapter 19 because Christianity was invading the culture. So I wanted you all to know those things because now it's 40 years later and Jesus sends him this letter. So let's read what he has to say. Oh, by the way, I'm going to take you through four things that we need to know here because he addresses four things here. The first thing we're going to look at are the good things. So first, Jesus talks about the good things. And here's what he said. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Okay, so Jesus knows all things about them, just like he knows all things about you and me. And he says that they're doing a lot of things right. They're working hard for God, aren't they? That's what it said. They're persevering there despite opposition that they're encountering in that culture in Ephesus. They won't accept the evil going on in the church. You know, oftentimes evil tries to come in from the outside because that's the world has a lot of evil in it. And so they resist all that, like false teaching and slander and gossip and all those kind of things that human beings do. And so they're stopping all that bad stuff there. And it's good. Jesus commends them for that. Also, it says there that they tested people who say they are apostles, but they're not. By the way, that means that people do that, and they do it still, don't they? What he's talking about are the original 12 apostles plus Paul. I call them the big A, the capital A apostles, because there aren't any capital A apostles anymore, even if somebody thinks they are. There's no modern apostles because, according to the Bible, they have to have seen the living Christ. And yet some today say they have that kind of authority because that's what they want. They want that authority. So today there's no capital A apostles. There are, I would say, small a apostles. That is because that word means sent ones. And so you, for example, someone who's a missionary going to an area that's unreached or a church planner going to a place that's sent like that, I would say they are small a apostles because they're sent ones. They're preaching the gospel in a place that hasn't heard it. And so, but the problem is some people really want the title. So you'll turn on the TV and there'll be a guy there with underneath his, on the screen, it'll say the apostle Fred or whoever he is. Now you're supposed to see that as a believer and using discernment and go, what does he mean by that? Go back to verse 2. Is he saying that he is, but he's not, like it says here? Because often that's the case. And so that church did not accept that. They had discernment about truth. And good for them. Jesus is commending them for it. And there's more that he says. Look at verse 3. He says, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is so great because Galatians tells us to not grow weary in well-doing. And so they're obeying that. They don't quit. They don't give up. They keep at it for Jesus. It's awesome. Working hard for the Lord. Endurance. If you visited them, that church, you'd probably say, wow, a lot of good stuff is happening here. This church is really, look at all the good that they're doing. All right, so let's recap here what's going on in Ephesus. So the Christians in the church of Ephesus, they lived in an ungodly culture. We established that. But 
we read as in those first few verses, they're not influenced by evil. They tested false things against the word of God. They don't quit and they're doing all kinds of good things for the Lord. And again, when you read this, you think that sounds like a pretty good shirt. Where is that again? Honey, check the Google. Let's go visit there. And okay, well, there's something else. Jesus isn't done. And so now we come to the second part here, and we're going to look at what's missing. Because something key, something essential is missing here. Verse 4, just one sentence. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Everything looks good on the outside, but there's a big problem, isn't there? You know, I picture them, they could really like sniff out false doctrine. But what did they do? They left their first love. And who's the first love? Jesus. It's important for us to understand it wasn't always that way. Paul the Apostle wrote one of the New Testament letters to them. And he had a lot of good things to say to them when he wrote Ephesians. As a matter of fact, I want to show you Ephesians 1.15. Look what it says. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. This is like his introduction to them. Like telling them how great their love for one another was. And so apparently they used to love, but now not so much. Warren Wearsby, he said, the honeymoon is over. (laughs) So that's what's happening here. You know what's happened? They've tried to replace love with works. And that can happen over, let me just say this as clear as possible. No amount of work for God can replace love. You can be busy serving God and not really love him or love the people that you serve. And, you know, this is something that I think is a real threat to our church, your church. Because think about what we do here. We teach through the Bible at all levels here. If you go over to the fifth and sixth grade class right now, you know what they're doing? They're teaching them through the Bible over there. Your kids, (laughs) if you got a fifth grader, that's what they do. In high school ministry here, in our small group, in the women's events and men's things, like that's what we do. We encourage the church to read through the Bible on their own. We talk about it all the time. We want our worship lyrics to be true. So we look at those songs before we start to sing them. We are like these guys. We resist evil as when when it comes up. There's lots of servants in our church. So all those good things, they're all good things. But my question is, what about love? I'm sad to report that I've met guys in my life over the years who could quote the Bible and teach what it means. They hated evil in our culture, but they were awful to their wife. They left their first love. That's what happens. It can't happen. Not to everybody. The Apostle Paul had a lot to say about love. And I wanted to show you something that he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Maybe we could read this out loud together as a church. Would you guys read this with me? He said, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Whoa. (laughs) That's pretty shocking that he would say that, isn't it? Nothing. In that same chapter, you might go read that on your own for extra credit. (laughs) But he says it there that it's like to do this is like clanging cymbals together. There's lots of noise. But look how much I'm sacrificing for God. And Paul would say, so what? Now, how does this even happen in the first place? How do you leave your first love? John Walvoord said, it starts with a cooling of the heart toward God. And that's a really descriptive way to think about it. Because we can begin to cool in our love for Jesus and others. You know, I can begin to cool for my concern for the lost or the marginalized people. Or you can begin, I think this is what happens most of the time. People, Christians, put other things between them and God in front of him. And that's what their focus is on. Now, while we're on this subject, 
I'd like to use this time to correct a misconception. I'm on social media enough to know that a lot of people point fingers and say the church needs to be more loving. And you know what? It's true. None of us have arrived and we could all be more loving, but so do they. Are you with me here on that? Let's not forget, guys, that a group of people is made up of individuals. <laughs> and the church is a large group of individuals. And so each person has a responsibility here. God showed me early on that if, that if we wanted a loving church when we started this, I had this conversation with him many times. And he showed me, well, I need to love people myself. <laughs> It's as simple as that. And it, it starts with whoever is in these chairs, in my chair. We're responsible here to love people, love God. One time I was sweeping out one of our church buildings. You know, we've moved so many times. I can't even remember which one it was. But I was sweeping. I think it was in the evening once. And it's because nobody else had done it. And I didn't want it to be dirty when the next time, you know, the people came. So I was there by myself sweeping. And I was really bugged about it. Uh, grumbling, complaining. I mean, you can picture this, right? I have to be the only one doing stuff around here, that kind of thing. I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you what happened. And in that moment, it was almost as if the Lord spoke to me. I could sense it in my heart that he was like, well, then just stop doing it then. Put the broom down. If you can't just do it for me and love for me, then don't do it at all. As a matter of fact, don't do anything if you're going to have that kind of of attitude. And you know, it was such a great lesson to learn. And I'm still learning that because it's in here. Herbert Lockyer said, backsliding starts in the heart. And it does. You get bitter. Who knows where you end up? The church in Ephesus reminds me of the Mary and Martha contrast. You know what I'm talking about? The sisters in the New Testament who were friends of Jesus and, and he would go to their house and stuff. And, and there's this one scene when these two sisters have Jesus over and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, just like enjoying him and loving him, you know, listening to him. Martha is rushing around the house, working, making food and stuff and complaining about Mary not helping. She said it to Jesus, get her to do something here. Jesus said, leave her alone. You're the troubled one. <laughs> She's doing the thing that I want her to do right now. To love me, listen to me, sit at my feet. And it's a great principle for Christians. Not that, I mean, there's work to be done. <laughs> there's someone has to do it. But we got to be careful about putting that in front of loving the Lord. Because Jesus is going to judge the things that the church has done when we stand before him at the Bema seat. And a big part of it, I think, is our motive, or our attitudes. Like, for example, we have a lot of children's ministry helpers here, teachers, helpers, and, and that. It, let's say, for example, that you teach the preschoolers every Sunday, but you complain the whole time. I'm not really sure what kind of reward you can expect for that. Same goes for the hospitality team or the setup and teardown crew here because we're meeting in a school. You know, I often look around and wonder, I hope we're doing this out of love for God. Or how about this one? <laughs> they keep bugging me to serve at our church, so I sign up to be an usher so they leave me alone. Please. <laughs> if that's you, don't even sign up. <laughs> if that's your motivation. Because to me, there's nothing worse than a Christian doing things because they feel obligated to do it, whether it's giving or whatever. Just keep it. Then. You know, one of the things that we've changed over the years here to help with this was to elevate community amongst the believers. Because if we go back five, six, seven years, we had a very serving oriented church. Like two thirds of the people here were serving in some kind of a ministry inside or outside of the church. But what I noticed is that we were all really disconnected still. And so I sought the Lord with the pastors and elders. And what we decided to do was to emphasize small groups and, you know, our house to house ministry. And what I've noticed, even though it's not perfect, it's way better and our love for one another. People know each other and love each other. We're in each other's lives and community has been built and things 
have changed. And so do our part as a, as a church, but then each of us are responsible for that on our own. We've learned here that they left their first love, Jesus. It's a big problem. I don't believe that you can love your family like you ought to if you've left your first love. I don't believe that you can be an effective worship leader or a youth group helper or an evangelist unless Jesus is first to you. That's the order of things. So he says that's what's missing. And hopefully that's stirred some thinking amongst us here. Well, he doesn't leave it at that. God is so gracious. The next thing he's going to do is show us how to fix it. Here's how you fix it. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Love is the only true motivation that God will recognize. That's how we have to do things, through love. Remember what the Bible says, John said, we love because he first love us. We put that on on lots of our church stuff because we want to remember that. We love, we love him because he first loved us. That's the motivation for all Christians all down through history. But if you've left it, he shows right here how to get back on track. So we need to pay attention to that because maybe one of you are dealing with this right now. He gives us three R's. I'm going to take you through them here. Three R's to do. So very practical things. One at a time. I'm just going to talk about them. The first R there in verse five, he said to remember. Okay. Remember. Of course, you have to be convinced that you've left it first off. So let's, let's assume that the person, maybe you have sort of drifted off. You've been convinced that you've left it. A few of us maybe are in that place, not on fire like you once were. If I could just talk about this in a more broad sense, it's probably safe to say that most, if not all, of us lack love in some areas, right? So then this would be very applicable to us. I initially titled this message when it was in draft form, Don't Lose Your First Love. And then I was convicted and changed it. It isn't lost, They left it. God never changed. They just left it, so they need to go back. It's still there. It's sort of like the prodigal son story that Jesus told in Luke 15. If you remember, the son whom the father loved left home to go live a life of sin. Remember that? He wanted to really just go ruin his life, waste his fortune, and do all kinds of things he shouldn't be doing. But at one point, he remembered what he had. And that caused him to go back. That was his first step to being restored. So the first step here that Jesus is telling us to fix this is to remember where we were. Because sometimes we get used to those we love and we take it for granted. We can take God for granted and forget what he did for us. So we're supposed to remember it. You know, I've seen this uh, play out in marriages over the years doing marriage discipleship through people in crisis and things like that. Because often what happens is there was this couple that once had a very exciting and a blessed marriage, and now it's just sort of there. Because one or both of them made some choices where they started to grow apart. Maybe it was a hobby or their work or whatever the thing is that got first position in their life instead of God. But they still live together. They're just kind of going through the motions now. But with them, and I've seen God fix this over the years with many couples, there's always hope if they want to remember what they had and return to that and do it God's way. And so that's what he's telling us here. The first thing that we have to do is remember what you had. Then second there in verse 5, the second R Jesus said to do is repent. Repent means to turn back or change your mind. I think that's the better way to define repentance. It's a change of mind about God and what he said and what to do. So think about somebody that's maybe they've grown cold to the plight of other people. They're just consumed with themselves as Christians. Well, they've left their first love if they are. 
Maybe it's somebody who now has this very legal relationship with God. They say, well, I'll do this if he does that. That's a danger sign of legalism as a believer. Or maybe somebody's put a relationship in front of God or a career. That's leaving your first love. That's an example here. And this is so good because people don't usually say, today I am going to move away from God. (laughs) People don't say that. It happens over time. It's like less of him and more of other stuff, something else. So that's for Christians. And then think about this. What's really scary is that you can do all kinds of things for God. You can even call him Lord and not have a saving faith in him so that when you stand before him, he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That is really scary. But for all those examples, believer or non-believer, you know what the answer is? Repent. That's what he's saying. Repent. Change your mind. Turn. So remember, repent. The third one in verse 5, the other R, is repeat. Repeat. He says, do your first work over. Do your first works over over. Go back to the kind of habits you had when things were better with God. So what were you doing then? And what's different now? You know, have you ever heard that expression, fan the flame? You were on fire back then, and now it's just like a little ember. So what were you doing then? Let's fan the flame, that kind of a thing. I like to think of this as as if you and I were driving to the Oregon coast. I'm driving because I can't be a passenger. So we're driving to the Oregon coast, me and you, About halfway there, we take a wrong exit. Now I say we, (laughs) because it's your fault too. So (laughs) we take a wrong exit, and we're heading north now instead of west. Way off track. So what do we have to do to fix that? You just go back to where you turned off wrong and get back on the road that you needed to be on. It's as simple as that. People make this so difficult in their life with the Lord, and it's really not that difficult here. So that's the exhortation. Now he gives an or else. Did you see that there in verse five? Or else what? What did he say or else what will happen? He will remove himself from that fellowship. Eek. I had somebody tell me uh, that they visited a church recently and when they walked in, they felt something was very wrong and dark. And this could be the reason right there. The spirit has left the building. Maybe. You know, this is a big reason why some churches die, I think. Because Jesus is just laugh. Well, if you're not going to do it like I told you, one last thing and then I'm going to move on. And to me, this is so important. So I hope I have your attention. Notice that he's not talking about doctrine. They have all that in good shape, right? This isn't about doctrine. You know what their problem is? Devotion. Devotion. And today I feel like the church... The critics are making it all about doctrine. And I get it because there's a bunch of pockets where the doctrine is bad. (laughs) And so that needs to be dealt with, right? We can all agree on that. But that's not the only problem here. (laughs) And I'd say more often than not, the problem is devotion. And maybe that's why this is the first church that they're talking to there. So to fix it, he said, remember, repent, repent and repeat. Verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay, we're not completely sure who this group of people are. Some have pointed out that their name means conquer the people. So that's kind of an indicator. The early church fathers, uh, some of them said that this group, the Nicolaitans, wanted to create a class system in the church uh, between the laity, which would be the, the people, the congregation, and the clergy, the leaders, sort of the priesthood, emphasize the priesthood kind of a thing. But remember, Jesus abolished the priesthood for the New Testament church. He's our high priest. He made a way so we could go boldly before the throne of grace. I don't have to go to a priest. In fact, don't go to a priest. But some people love to keep the priesthood alive. Religion loves to keep the priesthood alive. If you look around at Judaism, Catholicism, Mormonism, all have strong priesthood 
right? And so we got to be careful because that's not a New Testament doctrine. And so the Nicolaitans, it seems like that's what they were doing. Jesus criticized the Pharisees because they were all about that. And he criticized them because they loved their titles and their position and lorded it over people like the world does. And Jesus got on them about them because he would say, you guys love to be called rabbi in the marketplace. Oh, rabbi, rabbi, reverend. Oh, pastor, you're so awesome, pastor. That kind of thing. And you know what he said? Look what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. See, there's the test. This is how you know if the leader is a Nicolaitan or not. Do they love their position? and their title, or are they a servant? There's a real problem today in church leaders trying to control people. And now with social media, many are being very outspoken about it. It's going on right now all over the world. People are speaking out about this. And I think it's actually good because I don't blame them for being hurt by Nicolaitans. They want to see change, and so do I. And we should all want that. And, you know, we try to do some things here to remedy these things and how we organize our church and and what we expect from leaders and so forth. And also, like, how we handle our new to the fellowship. We call them now start here lunches for new folks. And many of you have been to those. And what I'll usually do at some point is ask a couple questions like, is there anything that you're concerned about that a pastor, church did to you that you want to know if we do those things and I want to talk about that or is there something that you've heard about Calvary Chapel that you want to ask me about we could clear up right now and are we doing that and those kind of things because the last thing that we want to do is hurt people by being Nicolaitans and the way to escape it is very simple you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself because that's what he told us to do. And then we won't be that, right? So that's how Jesus says to fix it. He gives us a simple prescription. All right, there's one more thing that we're going to cover here today, and we're going to look at a promise. What does Jesus promise them and us here? In last verse, we'll cover verse 7. So here's what he said. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is another way of saying, pay attention, you guys. <laughs> you see, God speaks to those who will pay attention, who are listening to what he has to say. And he says, go be an overcomer. How do you do that? Well, we don't leave our first love. <laughs> we love God first. Now, don't get this wrong. You aren't saved by being an overcomer. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, right? Amen? That's how we're saved. We're going to celebrate communion here in a moment. That's how we're saved. But being an overcomer proves that you have faith in Jesus. It's who you are. It's just who you are. Uh, I love that song. We have it on our plays in the background here. I heard it this morning. It's that gal, uh, Mandisa. Christian singer, and she has a song, I think it's called Overcomer, (laughs) and it goes, you're an overcomer, stay in the fight till the final round, and it's such a great exhortation, because I think that's all Jesus is saying, if I might put it that way, that he's just saying, look, don't give up and let your heart grow cold, just keep the faith, and keep going back to your first love, do it always, every day, and then you're in a safe place, right? Because he said, did you see there in verse 7? You know what? Paradise awaits you. All of you believers, paradise awaits you. You see, God is restoring what was lost in the Garden of Eden. You guys remember the story, right? In Genesis 1. I guess it's Genesis 2 and 3. There's these two trees, right? There's the tree of life where Adam and Eve, two people, two trees. (laughs) Adam and Eve could eat of the tree of life all they wanted, right? And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told them not to eat the fruit of that tree. He said, if you eat of that one, you will die. 
The interesting thing is God gave them a choice and they chose the second tree. And we know that they spiritually died that day. And then they eventually physically died too. God is not going to let mankind determine things. And so what he did is he took the tree of life and he put it in the paradise of God. And you're going to see it in heaven. You're going to get to eat from the tree because it represents eternal life. And that's supposed to be a, a motivation for us. God's love and his promise for us. It's supposed to rekindle our love for God in our hearts, this promise. The good news that he's reminding us he's with us and he's for us and he loves us perfectly. And he will show you how to do this if you will just listen and apply it. It's so great. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll enjoy communion, is I want to speak to you for a moment if you're not a Christian yet, because I've been talking to believers almost this whole time. You're in a difficult situation, and I know what it's like to be you, (laughs) because something is standing between you and eternal life, and it's your will. (laughs) You can choose eternal life right now. The unfortunate part is you inherited a sin nature from Adam and Eve. When they ate that, it became part of the human DNA. And so now you just inherit a sin nature. And then the things we do reveal who we are. I was watching this YouTube video from 1973, and it was Johnny Carson interviewing Billy Graham. Uh, Johnny Carson was actually the one who was started the late show, kind of late night shows. He was the first one. And he interviewed Billy Graham, a world famous evangelist, for like 20 minutes on national TV. And they talked about everything. And one of the things that came up was heaven and hell and sin and those kind of things. It was so great. Billy shared the gospel on national TV. And Billy pointed out that Johnny was a sinner and needed a savior. It was so great. And, and so they start talking about the Ten Commandments and so forth. Johnny says, so are you saying that we're all sinners and we've all broken all the Ten Commandments? And Billy goes, yes. <laughs> and he said, because... If you've violated one point of the law, the Bible says we're guilty of it all. And he says, in addition, it's a problem in the heart. And that's what Jesus said. It's a problem in the heart that we have. And so therefore, we're all in trouble. Everybody's guilty. And, but God, in his grace, sent his son to pay for our sins because we all need forgiveness. That's the remedy. And he says, will you accept my son? It's like the, the two trees again. <laughs> Will you choose life or are you going to stick with death? I would urge you, my friend, if you haven't done it yet, that you would choose life and you would do it now before it's too late. Matter of fact, I want to pray with you. And I know most of you are Christians, but if there's one or two of you or you're watching online or listening on the radio and you want to receive Christ as your Savior and be forgiven of all of your sins and look forward to paradise, eternal life with God, then pray with me, would you? Let's pray together. You might say something like, God, please forgive my sins. Thank you for sending your son Jesus for me. Thank you that he died on the cross for my sins. And then he rose again three days later. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for telling me the truth. And thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name.